Hello to you friends. This is Dhamma on air number nine. And there are six questions. And I move Dhamma on air number nine uh, under, to under the tree here because it was really nice weather today. It's hot, dry, not much wind. And since my teacher, the Buddha, he taught under a tree, I feel uh, particularly well grounded to do the same. But first, the normal two. Nam. Tasu. Bhagavato. Arahato. Sama Sambuddhasa. Worthy. Honorable and perfectly self-enlightened was the best Buddha. The first question goes like this. Does the death moment consciousness carry the remembrances of past lives? So first, what's the death consciousness? That, the, that we call the Chudikana the is uh, the very last moment of consciousness, discrete moment of consciousness before one dies. So the very last, the ultimate uh, moment of consciousness. What is the object of this consciousness in this particular moment? Is this a past life remembrance? No. Uh, so where is the remembrance uh, lying? Inside the brain? No. Uh, because you get a new brain inside this consciousness? No. They are stored all events to all universal events that has happened. Uh, since the beginning of time at the Big Bang, they are stored holographically uh, in all of space. And so also with the, the information to that, to do these events in the future, which are already de determined, that has a probability of one. And also the information to all events, mental uh, as physical, that uh, are impossible, they have probability zero and everything in between probabilities of one and zero that are probable uh, but not uh, likely 60% uh, likely 10% likely and so on they will have probabilities between one and zero these are also stored holographically what do I mean by that stored holographically uh, in space-time this is just to mean to say at this point on my finger I can make it small as I want infinitely small to a point like a point in space that has no spatial uh, distribution, has no uh, kind of like expansion, no length, until I cannot come down to any further one. It's called the Planck length. And even in that minimal length, discrete length, quantized length, they are all information to all uh, past events in this universe, uh, present events in this universe, and future events in this universe is stored and can be sampled. It's stored in a way, uh, and, and fluctuations in this wave. Actually, there's many waves, many frequencies, and many fluctuations. And in these fluctuations, uh, the information is stored. Just like in an analog radio receiver, for example, you, when you use your mobile phone, all information also here, in this particular point at my finger, stores all the information that passed now from uh, radio, TV, internet, uh, all uh, communication th through airplanes, ships, uh, mobile telephony, and so on. So it's a humongous amount of information passing through that point, and also through that point, and in principle through all points in the universe. So the information density in each point can be extremely in principle infinite. There the information is stored. This one, the brain, the fat bubble up there is more like an antenna. So it can sample this information. This information about your past lives, my past lives, can also be sampled by others than yourself. It can be sampled by a Buddha. And he can tell about it. Uh, so it has nothing to do with the brain. Uh, uh, neither has your remembrances actually now in this present life uh, much to do with the brain. Other than the brain is a transceiver, a receiver, and a sender out, and an emitter of information that can be resampled 
and re-remembered for those who have the right frequency and can tune into it. I hope this answers the questions. So, uh, the Judy moment does not carry uh, the remembrance of past life, does not carry the information of past lives. The information is stored holographically in all of space-time. What is then the object of the death consciousness, the Judy moment, the very last ultimate moment of consciousness before you die? Yeah, the, the text says that there can be three kinds. Uh, either one sees the destination, where one is going, so one sees the next state uh, one will have, whether it's up or down, uh, or on the same level. So one sees the destination, or one sees the karma, uh, that the thing that one did in the past that has the uh, most influence, influence over the destination, that is most determining on the destination. So what karma, if you kill somebody or give a million dollars to somebody or whatever, there's a lot of uh, karma, uh, billions of kammas, uh, of karmic uh, echoes going into this uh, transmigration from one life to the next life. However, there's one in particular that is more influential than the others. And this is the one one sees at the QT moment. This particular karma, what one did at that particular moment in the past. Or a murderer, he will see his, his killing. Huh? Uh, a giver, he will see his giving. Or whatever one did. One who has who's been sexually uh, promiscuous will see this sexual promiscuity that he has sex or she had sex with somebody else's uh, wife or man and that particular, at that particular moment and regret it bitterly and therefore go down, become very unhappy and go to an unhappy state also. Because what happens basically at the last moment of consciousness, that determines the next destination. So one align consciousness kind of like a line that it goes to a, a level where you generally have that particular consciousness uh, that you have in the death. So if it's a very exalted, peaceful state, then one goes upwards. If it's a very fearful state, a very difficult state, when one probably goes downwards. If it's a very ignorant kind of like state, one state, uh, one goes to the animal level. Just to as a kind of like uh, so so the truly moment is uh, conditioned by all these past life moments. And then you die, then you go to a destination where consciousness kind of like fall into a equilibrium, a minimum where there's a minimal distance between itself, the properties it contains itself, and the properties uh, of the mental states of the beings that are at that particular level. And we remember. Uh, that there are 31 levels of existence and humans are uh, level 5. Huh? Le question 2, I hope this answers this question. Question 2, are there different planes of early Buddhist attainments? Is this a test or criteria for them to be understood by normal people? Yes, there are different, many different levels of uh, uh, attainments. Uh, there's four major uh, and then can be there are two stages of them uh, of this formation. Uh, these are uh, explained, but there are also some other attainments. Uh, but I'll just take the main four. And this defines as being noble area. Uh, the first one is uh, the stream entrance, the sutapati. Stream entrance. What does it mean? Stream entrance. It means that you enter the stream that leads to nibbana. Sota also can. Sota means stream. Uh, so the party also, the sota also can mean that you have had a stream of information of Dhamma uh, inside your ears by hearing this, for example, or inside your eyes by reading the, the, the Dhamma books, the Tipitaka. Huh? So the sota has two meanings here. You enter the stream into Nibbana, this means that your destinies are determined. Within seven lights at most, one will reach Nibbana as a stream into it. One cannot go any eighth round, impossible, or ninth round, impossible. And secondly, and very importantly, one cannot go lower than human. So one will have seven lives at most, 
at the human level or divine level. This means crucially important. One cannot go to the barbecue. One cannot become a pizza, a hungry ghost. One cannot become an asura, an angry demon. One cannot become all kinds of lower states like animals at all the possible levels of animals, insects and whatever you have, shrimps, uh, lions, seals, birds, whatever. And there are many, many animals in the, more animals in the ocean than there are on the ground. And this we regard as lower than being on the ground. Insect is probably lower and uh, uh, on the ground the highest will be probably be reckoned uh, an elephant. And a uh, blue whale will be the highest a uh, karmic response you can you can have in or experience in 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 the ocean, but uh, there are not many blue whales or elephants around uh, compared to insects or shrimps, for example. Obviously, so this is first. Uh, you can say any lay Buddhist practitioner and also monk that has no attainment uh, should focus on this particular one single goal in this life to enter the stream to nirvana to become a stream entry. On my uh, website, there's many tools and many definitions about how to enter the stream, how to do it. So you go there, whatbuddhaset.net, and then uh, Google stream entry. And then there's uh, some posts with the details. The next level, you can say, is kind of like 25% enlightenment, 25% bodhi. It's a phase transition of consciousness. Uh, the approach to uh, stream entry is gradual, but the, the transition to stream entry is sudden. So you approach it gradually like you approach a door, and then suddenly you pass. Then you're on the other side of the door, just like you're passing through a door entry. Then afterwards, there come some stages. There's one stage after called the fruit, the fruit of the stream entry. And the stream entry, which he, you can be, and he, he can be or she can be in that state for many lives, stream entry. Sakka, uh, two levels up, uh, the king of the uh, Tamatimsa heaven, heaven he, he's a stream entry. There's many other stream entries. How do you recognize them? Very difficult. Impossible for one who's not speaking. Cannot see. Why is that so? Because uh, the non noble have never been at the noble level. Why is that so? Because you don't fall back from it. And that's another po important point by Buddhist attainments. You do not fall back. You can also go to Brahma level, very high level, uh, 16 or 18 up there, uh, 10 levels up from human, uh, f by the Hindu road. And you can also go by Christian, you can also go fair, fairly high on the divine level if you're a very good Christian or very good Hindu. But you can fall back again. That's a danger. You can fall all the way down to the barbecue and scream like a pig for centuries. Huh? And that's because it's not safe. It's not safe. When you have a Buddhist attainment, then you can only go higher. So this means that first you become streamers and then you will never become and not noble again. Then you can only go, either stay at the same level or go one up. So it's unidirectional. The attainment is unidirectional in Buddhism. In all other religions, it's bidirectional. You go up, but then you can fall down again later on. So this means that this going up is not safe. It doesn't safeguard to fall into painful states of woe, fearful states, unhappy states. Therefore, it cannot ever lead to the end of suffering because of this lack of safety. Crucial issue. Only Buddhism, only early Buddhism has this. And that's uh, one of the best arguments, actually. For, because Buddha emphasized many times that there are no nobles found in other traditions. No one. Zero. And that's a fact. And why is that a fact? Because it takes training of the Noble Eightfold Path. And it takes purification of the Ten Perfection. And it takes to produce the 31, 37 states that produce enlightenment to a certain degree before you become a noble. 
And there's no one outside early Buddhism that know what these 37 producers of enlightenment is. Since they don't know what it is, since they don't know what these states are, how can they ever perfect them and then get the fruit from it? Huh? It's impossible. It's impossible. Even when you know it on an intellectual level, there's still a long way to go because you have to practice it before to get penetration. Before there's get penetration into any understanding of these 37 producers of enlightenment, there will be no 25% enlightenment. This phase transition of consciousness, 25% upwards to the next level, will not happen before there is penetration to each of these 37 states. Which also you can find on what Buddha said that net, the 37 producers of enlightenment. Bodhi Pakir Dhamma. Bodhi Pakir Dhamma. So the next state after one has got this state up, which is irreversible, and it's a phase transition of consciousness. Then there's the next state. Uh, then one is on this stream into level, then one works still, trains uh, over a long period, purify the mind over a long period, usually many lives actually, before the next state. It can also happen, it, it, the, the progression through the status can be very variable. Uh, that's the example of people who have progressed through all four stages uh, in a, a few seconds. And there's many other examples, this is the extreme case, huh? There's another example where this takes uh, the same process of going through uh, to enlightenment has taken uh, 100,000 lives. This is more like it, or more. And even maybe between stage one and stage two, thousand lives, hundreds of lives, not unusual. Nevertheless, the next state. The, again, it's approached gradually over a long period, and then it happens suddenly. The perception of the stream entry uh, sudden transition is groundbreaking. It, it is uh, shattering. It is uh, astonishing. It is... Uh, Yeah, how can I say it? It's, you're, it's stunning. I probably best expression. One is stunned by it. It's not an unhappy state. It's very happy. But still one is stunned by it. Because it's a complete redefinition of what it means to be a human being. And what it it makes uh, what it, it what makes sense basically. So the whole meaning, atta, of the world and oneself is redefined in one in one single moment. Usually, the object of uh, the mind of the consciousness before approaching the, to this is the four noble truths, or one of them. Usually, the first one. This is suffering. This makes one approach because it, it releases. One sees that everything is suffering, that there's no one in samsara or in this constructed world, inside, outside, past, present, or future, that is not suffering. So, what? why pass around here? Anyway, in the first place, it's only suffering. And this pushes one through the door. Then suddenly, uh, one turns his mind to that since there is suffering, there must be something else. And what is this? Else? This is Nibbana. And when one points the mind from suffering to Nibbana, this means the next consciousness has Nibbana as its object. And it's right there, clack, it switches. It's there when the mind has Nibbana as its object, internal object. That the phase transition occurs. This not only goes for the 25%, this also goes for the next step and the next step and full enlightenment. 100% enlightenment. Bodhi. 
in all these four moments, the object is the same, Nibbana. That's the only object that can enlighten. Anyway, the next four stages, I just mentioned as for technicalities, uh, the next stage is uh, Sakatagami. Sakatagami means once returner. It goes to a divine state, can have more than one life there. Uh, and then come back here as a human one time. Then he finishes the job here. Next time he comes, become a human. So he returns to here one time. That's why he said once return. All the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, before they become Buddha, before they go to the contented level, uh, the, the Tushita Devas, and stay there for, there for a very long time and have a very nice vacation together with their friends and wives uh, up there and stay very contented. They stay in contentment. Then uh, they are Sakatagams. They are all Sakatagams. It's said that the Tushita heaven, the contented level, is the uh, most beautiful exquisite and satisfying level that is it in the Kama Loka, in the lower 12 levels of the 31 levels of Buddhist cosmology. So, Sakatagami. Sakatagami, when then earth, he usually is a fairly good meditator, but not an expert. Then he starts meditating after Sakatagami. He has several fruit moments he, where he enjoys his state of being a Sakatakam. Whereas usually a states of, of which are very peaceful and also contains dhyana, very satisfying and very blissful. Very serene. Exquisitely serene. Upekka. Equanimity. So he works uh, with, or she works on this stage too, mainly through meditation, reach the jhanas and reach the second jhana or higher. And then, uh, if succeeding at that level, either in the middle of their life or in the end of their life, either with effort or without effort, they go to the next level, which is called anagam, and no non returner or never a returner. They do not come back to the human level. Never have there been seen an anagami on the human level. And therefore you cannot recognize them. Because they are not describable by human language. They are fairly high. They go usually to the pure abodes. Where their bodies are made of light. And their food is joy. And it's said that when they come together, then they cannot recognize each other because uh, it's only light. But when they go away, then they can recognize each other and give it each other a name. Because the, the color and the expansion of the radiance out there in space, uh, which they move through freely, already at a lower level, much lower level. One level up, you can move freely through space. Uh, then they can see and recognize who's who. They are excessively joyous, excessively joyous. They spend uh, their entire life with this ex excessively long, uh, but time goes slower there, so it's subjectively, but in, it's many billion years, many billion years. It's many hundred billion years. Actually, they live uh, at pure abodes, they live many universal cycles. Several hundreds. I can't remember the exact number, but several hundreds universal cycles. So they see a universe come and go, like let's say, like we uh, experience a decade. They see a universe come and they see it go, which is probably taking hundred billion years. But they are exceedingly jubilant, jubilant, the Appasana Devas, or the pure boats. Then they, from there, they go can go only go one step up and they can go five steps up then they come up and Akanita Deva 
Uh, and there's something that's called an Akanita traveler. An Akanita means non-senior. And that's a kind of a Buddhist joke because uh, they have gone all through this level, uh, five levels, different levels, where you live several hundred uh, universes, universal cycles, aeons, kalpas, of which each one is lasting in the order of uh, 60 to 100 billion years. So when you reach this non-senior level, then you are really non-senior, if any can be designated as such. This is anagami level. They they never never go downward. They only go either one step up, become enlightened at that level. When they are born there, when they come into existence there, they're not born from any womb. They have no father or mother. They eat no material food. They don't have a, mat a gross material body. Brahma devas don't have a gross material bodies like we have. They have a material body. They have a form. They're not formless like on the last five levels. Uh, they're conscious, of course, but uh, they do not eat food and don't have excrement and urine and don't have a mother or father. They are spontaneously reborn. Many devas are there. Are there. Then, after that, anagami is only arat level. Arat means worthy. This is full enlightenment. There's three kinds of enlightenment uh, regarding who you are and how you came there and how long time it, it had ta has taken you. And, uh, but it's the same enlightenment. So everybody, all arahats, including Buddhas, they are uh, reach the same Nibbana with the same enlightenment. But uh, they reach it with different qualities and different levels because they have their path has taken the Samasam Buddhas use very long time. They use uh, at least 400,000 uh, universal cycles and up to 16 uh, times 100,000 universal cycles to get there. So this is a Sama Buddha, Buddhas, of which there are three kinds also. Then there's a solitary Buddhas, and then there's a disciple Buddhas or disciple Bodhi, who are enlightened by discipleship. The first two Samasam Buddhis and Pachika Buddhis, they do it by themselves. They don't do it by a teacher. They go there, they are Samasam Buddhis, they are self enlightened. They have teachers, but they discard the teachers because they, they see the teaching they teach them, even though they can lead to a very high level of Brahma Deva, cannot teach them the end of suffering. So they carry on, they discard their teachers which they respect very much, but nevertheless they discard them anyway, leave them and go further on by themselves. And thereby they often re, not reinvent, but rediscover the path to Nibbana in their particular time. They usually do it alone. So there can only be one Samasam Buddha at the earth at a time, but there can be more than one Pachika Buddha. And we have records of there has been up to several hundreds of them. Then they will meet on a, in a particular mountain in Himalaya. And then they will go into a particular state, Nirodha Samabhati. It means a state of cessation, of perception and freedom. It's excessively pleasant. And they will stay in that state for a week. Then come out and split up. There's three caves there, very large caves, close to Lake Anotata. Uh, nevertheless, most beings do not experience these two high enlightenment forms. They experience because they meet someone who's enlightened, or they meet another disciple who are enlightened and thereby can teach them. So they, they go to enlightenment through Savaka Bodhi. They are enlightened, enlightened by discipleship. Why is that so? Because they cannot do it by themselves. They are unable to do it by themselves. They have to have a teacher. However, it has to be said that uh, attaining the first level, the first attainment, stream entry, 25% enlightenment, after here you don't need any teacher. Up to that level you need a teacher and teaching. But after that level you're independent. That is to say, Let's say we have this, we have a city on Mars and there's plenty of food in this uh, Mars city, and, but there are no people 
uh, kind of like a Mars, the first uh, space station on Mars. A uh, small space station with some food and freezers and uh, oxygen and water and what have you, toilets and things. Then you take a, uh, a noble, a stream intro. No books, no nothing. You put him up there. Can he do it? Yes, he can do it. He can do it by himself. No books, no teacher, no nothing. He can do it by himself. Or she can do it by herself. Why is that? Because they are independent. After having stepped up 25% towards Nirvana, they are independent. They don't need anything more. It's embedded in their heart, in their consciousness, in their whole being, in their mentality. They can remember much of the Dhamma by heart. So they, to reach this stage of independence and safety, because you cannot fall down below a human level, and there's only seven lives left. That's the goal of, of all lay and monk and ordained Buddhist life. If not, no. Is there any criteria? No. There's no criteria to, to, to be recognized. Uh, most people who claim to be non-noble, uh, to be noble are non-noble. 99%. Uh, they have fallen in love with their ego and then they, they want to gratify their ego with the noble state and then they claim to be noble. And it's very sad. Actually, Buddha, he waited as long as he possibly could, as long as he possibly could, to tell about these four attainments. Because he knew that people would start uh, boasting about a state they never have attained. And it's the same with the jhanas. The many meditators think they have attained jhana, and they have attained just a, a fairly preliminary state uh, of samatha, of calm. So they mistake their own level, and they overestimate by far their own state. And uh, sometimes it is something in between comic and pathetic, but as a monk you cannot do much about it, because they are very sensitive to critique or to questioning about whether this is correct that the state is so and so high. And they will come fighting you if you do, if you question you do that. So one can uh, usually, the only thing one can do is smile silently and silently. They have to run out their story and experience uh, being ridiculed, and also later looking back uh, at all the and uh, all these false claims that they have uh, postulated. And this is, of course, then one feels embarrassed uh, looking back and see that this was not true. One ran around here, huh? Superman, Superwoman, and then this was wacky, wacky. Ah, enough of that. Uh, question three is more practical. What to do with marijuana and cannabis abuse? It was a question I got uh, this from a young man who said this was his vice. And it's of course very, 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 very common. There's uh, smoking tons of marijuana and cannabis and pot and joints. And it's uh, have starting to become legal uh, in various countries, Holland, uh, various parts of the USA, uh, many other places. So, uh, big deal, big issue. Uh, first, I'd like to say uh, something about uh, a funny feature there is with this cannabis. Why do people uh, prefer cannabis or marijuana or pot and uh, weed uh, to smoke that instead of, for example, cocaine uh, or alcohol or uh, amphetamine or whatever? Uh, they do that because, often because, they have been meditators before. Why is that so? Because the cannabis uh, intoxication is very calm. You calm down. You're not excited like you are in cocaine intoxication or like in alcohol intoxication. Uh, so there's no excitation in the cannabis intoxication. This is kind of like very, uh, very calmful state, a peaceful state, where people usually don't do much. Uh, maybe fall asleep. So, and this is because uh, they like that because they have feel this calm state before. What is that calm state called when you meditate? Samadha. So they, when they recognize that same state during intoxication or a similar state, not the same state, but similar state, look-alike state, in a later life, uh, by smoking marijuana in their, in their teens, they get hooked on this marijuana immediately. Because they recognize the state. It's a subconscious memory. They cannot, re they cannot remember that they remember it, but they remember it anyway, enough to be hooked.
Uh, however, the cannabis state cannot uh, be compared to Samada. Why not? Because Samada is clear, ultra clear, while cannabis intoxication is unclear. Cannabis intoxication also makes you lazy. Liturgy and laziness uh, wobbles up and you fall asleep. Samada don't make you lazy, don't make you tired, you don't fall asleep. Uh, thirdly, uh, analytical th thinking is goes up in Samada, in Buddhist calm, but it goes down when you're intoxicated uh, by cannabis. Uh, for example, if you try to play chess, uh, you will be beaten out by those who usually can beat in chess. Uh, it's a very analytical game, you have to think about a lot. But uh, if you smoke uh, marijuana, smoke pot, uh, then you are beaten out. Same also goes off, of course, if you drink alcohol. Uh, chess players, they don't drink alcohol or smoke anything because they, then they lose the game. So how what to do with, with it? Uh, yeah, one has to see the disgusting state. It's a disgusting state. And contagious is unclear. It's uh, hallucinative, it's just thinking about this and that, and it looks very artistic and looks very colorful. But afterwards, for example, if you ask a musician that makes music, and then uh, they, it sounds very beautiful when they are in uh, cannabis intoxication, but afterwards, when they listen to the recording, then it's a lousy recording, because they are not accurate with the instruments. They are sailing around on the beat, and it's a mess. It's a mess. And also, if you try to paint something or draw something, the inspiration may be there, but the technical thing to get the inspiration out on the paper and be productive is lost. This is not in, 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 in Buddhist calm. That's the opposite. The ability to analyze, the ability to see, the clarity, the insight you gain from it is real. It's not hallucinating. And the way of uh, or ability to uh, get what you have inside your head out through the arm and through drawing or make music is also built. Then there's an important aspect, probably not known by many. What's the comic result of intoxication, all intoxication, not only marijuana? It's a, a, a future insanity. Why is that so? Because one, when one intoxicates, one makes one, oneself a kind of insane or deranged or mentally unstable or kind of like one gets paranoia and so on. And so this is a, one do, does that deliberately, makes one intoxicated and deranged, mentally speaking, in order to get a particular intoxicated mental state, which one is clinging to. The future result, the comic result in this life and in the next life is psychosis, insanity, uh, usually of the side uh, of the kind uh, schizophrenia, or any other can also be fear and anxiety. Uh, can be many kinds of, of insanity, both curable and non curable. This is worth noticing. Huh? During intoxication, one heaps up probability to be reborn as a nutcase, a crackpot nutcase. Huh? You know. That's crazy. That's crazy. Not only do you ruin your present by this intoxication, uh, because young one becomes lazy, uh, uh, careless, lose initiative, uh, cannot get the bills paid, uh, or get your clothes washed, or do the dishes, or whatever is necessary to be done. You cannot do this by smoking joints. Huh? And then the second one, on the long run, there's this insanity creeping up. Is keeping on noticing the dangers by intoxicating oneself and feeling shameful about it, being fearful about it, fearful about the consequences. Then one has to kind of like drag it out, drag oneself out of this mud, this mental mud that uh, smoking pot and uh, cannabis and marijuana is. It's a mental mud and nothing else. There are many hippies that claim that they have spiritual attainments through intoxication. And that is so much bullshit. They have no attainments. They come out after their intoxication more confused when they went in. So they have attained nothing. More than muddling up and uh, 
producing more mental dust, more distraction, and also mud, so they cannot. So it's a very romantic illusion that one can uh, make a, approach a purity, or uh, approach anything sacred or holy uh, by intoxicating yourself. You cannot. You cannot. That's an illusion. This one should just discard. It's not a way to the holy. It's a way <laughs> down. Potheads are not holy. They are lazy. And usually very simple minded. So stop that. Question four. Explain step by step the practice of universal friendship. Meditation, meta meditation. Yes, one starts with focusing on one particular aspect. I can use then one whatever positive aspect one can find uh, will do. But I have one that is, that is particularly good, and that's the fact that all beings can be enlightened and will be enlightened eventually. From Hitler to Stalin uh, to Mao to uh, any terrorist. Uh, from any country, uh, any killer, they, any animal, uh, any whatever conscious being that is, they will be enlightened. So they have the seed to enlightenment in them. And it's seeing this and knowing this, I think, is very, very productive of this mental state uh, called friendship. Because you can be friend with them, you can forgive them that they are now uh, bossing around doing something else, maybe something evil or bad or wrong. But nevertheless, they will be in one day and be in light. So they have this sacredness or this holiness in them, embedded in them, but covered up uh, and fractured and kind of like almost forgotten. But they will find it eventually. And like we also will find ours. And they, all the others in the past that has become enlightened, they also have found their, their sacredness within their own consciousness. Their ability to enlighten, become enlightened. The ability to awaken from the illusion. So uh, this I use, and then I, uh, then a smile comes on my face, and I will uh, can one can beam from one's heart region, not from one's intellectual center up here, the prefrontal cortex, but from the heart region. One beams out in the first frontal quadrant. May all beings be happy. May they be healthy. May they be successful. Then one moves to this quadrant. May all beings be happy. May they be whatever you wish of good for yourself, you wish for others, all, all beings. That includes others and yourself. And then backwards, this direction. This is, then four directions are huh? in front of you, to this side, to the back, to that side, and then uh, upwards and downwards. As above, so below. May all beings, with no exceptions whatsoever, may they be happy. You wish wholeheartedly. Then one take it one step up and one say, uh, may all in this in, in this village or in this house, in this house, may they be happy. May all in this village be happy. May all in this country be happy. May all on this continent be happy. May all on this planet be happy. May all on, in this galaxy be happy. May all on this, in this uh, cluster of galaxies be happy. May all in this universe be happy. May all in this multiverse be happy. May all in this in excessively waste, infinite cosmos. May all conscious beings there, on whatever level they are, on these 31 levels of existence, may they be happy. Exceedingly happy. Joyous, glad. That's the way to do it. So you expand it up into infinitude. Infinitude in space. You, you wish it in, back in time and forward in time. Infinitude in time. Infinitude in intensity. Try to reach infinitude in all possible qualities. Regarding this goodwill that beams, shines, beyond anything, whatsoever. The effect of this is that one can lift mind out of depression. 
So any depression, even severe depression, up to suicidal level, will evaporate in three months by regular practice, 45 minutes each day. Then one practices also as a mantra in the bus, on the work, may they may be happy. In the queue in front of the uh, at the supermarket, may all these beings in front of you be happy. And may the lady at the at the cashier, may she also be happy. May this door also be happy. It cannot be happy because not conscious. But may it be happy anyway, if it could be. So uh, there you see uh, suddenly, if you say, say that with you, I don't need to say it high. Just repeat it inside yourself. Then suddenly they say, ah, you, you can have my place. You can come forward here in the queue. So you, you're changing your internal consciousness. Then because it's not local, because it's basically everywhere, then they also change their consciousness. So you're affecting the universe with this universal friendliness, infinite friendliness. Metta parami. Metta meditation, metta means friend, and friendliness meditation uh, is extensively explained on my website. And there's one video uh, on my YouTube channel, and it's also on the Mimi channel, regarding this metta meditation. There's one Dhamma talk on meta meditation on my SoundCloud profile, and there's I think I will guess 50 uh, posts on what BuddhaSit.net regarding meta meditation. Dhamma drops. You just search metta or friendliness, and you will get them. Take it from there. Question five. How are the senses actually guarded in praxis if you move through a western city? Yeah, first one doesn't look at the opposite sex or one sexual uh, uh, or any sexual attractive object. Uh, it can also be a photograph uh, of an attractive woman or man. One doesn't look at that. When walking through, one looks uh, approximately uh, between three and four meters in front of you, down. Doesn't look at the other people, doesn't look them in the eyes. And then you could just keep aware of your steps keeps aware of your feelings and keeps aware of your thoughts. If you've seen an, an object that is uh, any, any kind of object or, or taste any kind of object or see any kind of advertisement, then uh, there's a trick. You don't, uh, re you don't uh, clutch on any particular feature by that object. For example, if it's a sexual object, uh, for a man, for example, typically would be typically would be uh, focusing on the, on the breasts uh, or uh, on the bottom or on the lips of the or on the hair of uh, the pretty female and of the, uh, the, the, the for the woman it will be uh, whether the body is of the male is muscular or not but can also be certain other kinds one just cut that out and if, whenever someone sees one's eyes or one's perception in general goes to any particular aspect, that also goes for the taste. If you taste something, ah, whether it's sweet or not, no, don't pay attention to it. Don't pay any attention to it. So don't pay any, any particular attention to any particular detail of whatever sense object there is in this Western city. Don't pay, pay any attention to the wholeness of the sense object, of the advertisement or whatever. One just stay within one's own frame of reference. And that is seeing all bodies as a frame, an empty frame. Seeing all form as an empty frame. Seeing all feeling as a reactive response. Seeing all mind internally or other's mind as a set of moves that's just passing by. And seeing all phenomena as mental states. These are these four frames of reference that this is your ground, that this is your home, that you take with you all the time while looking down three or four meters. Body and form as a frame, feeling as a reactive response, mind as mood, phenomena as mental states, only. and nothing else. That's the way. That's the four foundations of awareness. Keep doing it. Keep coming back to it. 
keep tracking on it, and then they, it will open up for you. Here, here, there. The last part, question, what is a Gandapa? Are these beings around everywhere and how long do they exist in that state? Uh, what is a Gandapa? A Gandapa is a being that has been enlightened on one level above the humans. And they are part of the Katu Maharajika world, the four kings, protector kings. That protects the Buddha and all Buddhists and the four corners. Uh, for the next level, uh, where Saka resides, he's a king up there. He has these guys. Gandapa is one of the four kings, uh, uh, ordinees or, or, or people. The four kings, they all have a lot of people around them, or beings around them. And these are the Gandapas. The Gandapas are musicians. They can usually move through the air, uh, and they are musicians. There are some, some here uh, at, at the earth level, and then there are some at the higher level. Why can't we see them? Because they exist in their own time frame. So time is discrete, that is, time is quantized. Just like energy, there is a small energy packet you cannot cut up, that's because a quantum. And this quantum of energy is a minimal packet that can be exchange of energy uh, during a, a given process. So also there's a minimal packet of time, it's called the Planck moment. Uh, it's very, very small amount of time, you cannot cut it in two. And it's probably what the Buddha called a Dhamma, not Dhamma, but Dhamma with long A, with a hyphen over one, which is a fundamental state, the fundamental state, the brick, uh, space-time brick of which reality is made of. Very small brick, very, very small brick. Uh, anyway, the Planck moment takes uh, uh, 5.6 times 10 to the minus 43 seconds. This means that is on one second is uh, 100,000 billion, 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 billion Planck moments, and thereby also states, Dhamma states. And the material world is also blinking, but it's blinking much slower than the mental world. And this way entails that, uh, that there are seven mental moments. If you have one material moment, one material Dhamma, even though it's very short, there's 17 mental states, that's the Abhidhamma, basically. But it's only the last two registration moments where you're actually conscious about it, what's happening. Same thing that will correspond to a, a computer have something like 28 states and then outputs its calculations to the screen. It's only seen here, it's calculated here and then it outputs to the screen. Then you can see what's calculated. Same thing with this, this thing up there, it calculates and then it updates registrates what's, what's the reality. This means that if you are, if we are conscious in this time frame, these two last of 17, then there can be other beings that are conscious in that time frame, here, in the same space-time domain. But since we are not conscious in this, in the same sub-moment that they are conscious in, we can never perceive it, and they can never perceive us. But there can be overlap sometimes. So they exist in another time frame, in another phase of time than we do. We exist in the same place, the same locality, but since time is blinking very fast, it means if uh, there's two blinks here, and then what is in between, nothing in between, then there can be a, a blink in between here from another world, a parallel world, a, in the same space, and these two, uh, two worlds will never meet will never clash, and whoever being in this world and in this world that is bringing out of phase with the first world, they will never see each other and be unable to communicate. That's a, that's a trick. It's, a, it, it's basically a consequence of discreteness. It's a, it's a consequence of, of the quantum. That there are some small, smallish units. So the whole thing is discrete. It's blinking, it's quantized, space is quantized, time is quantized, energy is quantized. We can turn back to that. So how long do they exist in that state? So they are everywhere. Buddha said that there are 
in all plants they, they are uh, living uh, these earth tables of which you can see some of these gandapas they are there's one story uh, that's why we are not allowed to cut uh, plants uh, that are living there's one story of a monk at the Buddhist time who, who did that he, he cut a tree to for forgetting firewood then there was an earth table a female earth table living inside that tree and she had a son and he lost his arm because it, uh, the monk chopped it off because he didn't see that there was a being there and she told him don't cut don't cut but he, he didn't hurt it he didn't hear it so he could just cut and she was exceedingly mad at him uh, angry because her son lost her arm uh, and she was almost killing him because she was abili her abilities she had ability to do that just like that but she controlled herself and went to the Buddha and told the story and then he he praised her for not killing the monk and then he said to the uh, monks that they were not allowed to chop firewood from live trees. Uh, they only love, it has to be dead logs that lying on the ground, where there usually are no devas living inside. Uh, there's also, there's some, uh, in the text there's some mention of them. Uh, there's a love story, a very nice love story, about one Gandhava who's called Panchasikka. He has a lute of uh, Belua wood, and he's uh, fallen in love with Chimbaru, he's a Gandapa's chief. And Chimbaru has a very uh, nice looking daughter, which was Saka's uh, dancing lady. Saka was one step up. Uh, so she was a dancing lady at the, the king's court. And Panchasika, he was, uh, he fell desperately in love with her and got her in the end actually. So happy, happy ending. Uh, how to become a Gandapa? Uh, yes, it was at the Buddhist time and, it, and even uh, in the early times of Sri Lankan Buddhism, if you come to become a Gandapa, it was reborn as a Gandapa, it was recognized as kind of like, if a monk did it, it was embarrassing. Because it's only one step up. And the Gandapa, they are musicians and, uh, you know, it was regarded as an uh, incomplete job. And this you do from uh, following the five precepts and uh, practicing morality and a modest amount of giving, a modest amount of, of merit producing. And, and then uh, avoidance of most of the dangers. And so it's kind of like, it was regarded at the Buddhist time kind of like an uh, incomplete job. Okay, you did well, you, you went one step up, but it was <laughs> minimum step one could do to become a heavenly musician. When the heavenly musicians fall down and come down here, they will be musicians again. And they're usually very good musicians. Very, very good musicians. They have a natural talent because of their remote remembrance of their past life. I hope this covered the subject. Uh, the wind is up and I'm uh, eager to see the sound quality uh, on this recording. It's probably bad. But nevertheless, uh, thank you for your attention. And remember to press subscribe uh, to this channel so you can get more of the same stuff that will ensure you if heated to a happy future. Now, Tasso, Bhagavato, Arahato, Samma Sambutasa, Worthy, Anabo. And perfectly self enlightened is the best. Thank you for your attention.